Okay, the third character is maybe the first influence. Is maybe of all of them the scariest and, and, and the worst. I've talked about him, but it's been years since I've talked about him. I probably should talk more about him, given his influence on the right and given the JVD Vance's influence by him. I should probably do a, a show where I talk about him and, or, 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 you know, read some of his stuff and bring some of his stuff to you guys for analysis. But this is Curtis Yavin. Curtis Yavin, who used to blog under the name of Minicius Mobug um, and uh, has been now, I think, pretty influential on the right, particularly in the uh, crazy alt-right, the far right, the you know, new right, really the new right, which is the, the, the title for all of these guys. Uh, he, is a, he is part of the new right. He is considered the house philosopher, house philosopher of the uh, new right. Uh, he's been influential now for probably uh, going on 15 years, something like that. Um, and uh, he is what he calls the, a neo-reactionary, uh, neo-reactionary. Uh, he's a little bit but like Deneen, but a, a lot more aggressive and a lot more explicit. Uh, Yavin, for example, this is a quote from him, from Van uh, uh, an interview he did with Vanity Fair in 2022. Quote, the fundamental premise of liberalism is that there is inextricable march towards progress. I disagree with that premise. Yavin believes that we are degenerate. We have degenerated into a corrupt oligarchy that's run by elites who, who just want power and that don't serve the public interest. You know, okay, we can, I can agree with that. There's a lot to agree there, right? That's the challenge. The solution, Yavin argues, the solution he proposes, um, is a monarchical leader, so a monarchy, a, a king-like figure, or as he calls it, a national CEO, or what he's called in other places, a dictator. Uh, who can, in a sense, debug the American political order like a computer program and debugging some bad code. But, and, and that's, that's kind of Politico's interpretation. But yeah, he, he believes in a, in, a, in a dictator, on authoritarianism. I mean, a benevolent dictator, not, a, not one of the bad guys, a, a good guy, dictator. But he, he believes the only way you can solve the problem is through authoritarianism. The system right now is in its death throes. We're heading towards something like that, no matter what. Um, it, you know, and, and the world is rigged. Uh, everything is, is polluted. If you read his stuff, half of it's undecipherable. You just can't understand what the guy's talking about. Uh, you know, I think that's what makes him a philosopher. I think people are categorized as philosophers when people reading them can't understand what they're saying. They immediately say, oh, he's a philosopher. I mean, right? Because they're associating with him with Kant, because you can't understand a word Kant says. Um, so uh, now, uh, Vance has, has said he considered Yavin a friend. He cited his writings, um, in, 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 particularly when he talks about firing all the civil servants and replacing them with Trump people. A, a power grab as a power grab, right? You remember I, I, I gave you this quote um, uh, where he, he, he says, you know, he, he wants to disrupt this all. He wants to replace it with our people. I mean, um, this is directly, he gets this from, your, uh, uh, from Yavin. Uh, use power, use power. Yeah. Adam Schmidt says, Yavin is, la is uh, unintelligent. The stuff I did not understand was laughable. Uh, the stuff I did understand was laughable. The stuff he didn't understand, he didn't understand. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's absolutely right. I, I, he is the inspiration behind what do you call him? Uh, 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 um, 
BAP, Bronze Age Pervert, uh, was also inspired by Yavin. But Yavin is very, very popular among the new right, uh, among kind of... I, I talked about him back in, I think, 2016, 2017, 2018. He was very influential in the Claremont magazine. I'll, I'll talk about Claremont in a minute. Um, so very, you know, the fact that the fact that Vance considered Yovin a close friend or a friend, I don't know. It, it, that's shocking and crazy and uh, just every more reason to believe that we really are, really are heading towards uh, uh, authoritarianism here. And, and Vance is, is a big step in that direction. And that, you know, Trump is the vehicle, but Vance potentially is the actual, the actual content, the actual real thing. Um, did Hoppe influence Moberg or the other way around? My guess is that Hoppe influenced Moberg, not the other way around. That would be my guess. Right. A, lot of, um, a lot of kind of right-wing libertarians... You know, like the Mises Caucus are, are influenced by, by uh, Moberg and uh, or by by Yavin and uh, just a, a horrible, horrible ideas. I mean, explicitly authoritarian. Whereas Deneen, you know, couches it all as, you know, we need a we need a uh, we need to impose our morality on people, but this is all within the context of having elections and the American constitution is good and the American system of government is good, but we need to use more force. Uh, Yavin is to hell with the American system of government. It, it's corrupted what we have and what we need is something completely different um, and, and, and so on. I mean, this is J.D. Vance's influence. It, this is an influence on J.D. Vance. All right, number four is René Giraud. I, I mentioned this yesterday. He's a, he's a French philosopher. I don't really understand Giraud, but um, uh, he plays a big role in Vance's conversion to Catholicism. He plays a big role in Vance's understanding of what's unique about Catholicism. And, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll read you a quote in a minute that relates to this. I don't think we have time for anything else other than this deep dive into J.D. Vance's ideas. I'm not sure we'll get to any other item. Uh, but... You know, I'm not sure this is going well with you guys because, uh, you know, uh, uh, raising, uh, raising funds and super chats is very, very meager today. Very meager. It hasn't been this meager in a long time. So I I'm wondering if you're just distracted or, uh, or not interested. I don't, I can't tell. So show, show some love with dollars. Um, so Giraud was somebody that Peter Thiel introduced him to. And who became a huge influence on him. And, uh, you know, I'll read from the essay. And I haven't read Giraud. I don't know that much about him. Another friend of his, an intellectual influence, supposedly, is Sohab Amari, who is somebody I've been talking about, again, for, I don't know, four or five years. A really, really bad guy. Um, I, uh, I've, come, I've, I've fought with him a little bit on Twitter, on and off. But Amari is, uh, is, has had kind of a, a weird uh, uh, intellectual, political evolution. He started out as a secular, uh, a secular uh, immigrant from Iran. Uh, he, you know, he came over as a teenager. He was a Trotskyite, a communist, Trotskyite in college. He became a neoconservative. A lot of neoconservatives started out as Trotskyites. He, he then became a neoconservative and was an editor at the Wall Street Journal. But then he... He, like many others, in 2016 converted to, guess what? Judaism. No, no, Catholicism. He converted to Catholicism. Um, he voted for Hillary Clinton out of disgust for Trump. But then he dramatically moved to the right, embraced Trump, and became uh, an advocate for something called, and I'm reading here from the political article, a working class conservatism with roots in traditional Catholic social democracy. Uh, he calls himself a pro-life New Dealist. 
So an admirer of FDR who is pro-life. By the way, if you have questions, I see where do objectivists go? Uh, Super Chat is a great way to ask a question. You, for two bucks, you can ask it and you can show that way support. Uh, right now he's the co-editor of Compact Magazine, uh, which is an online journal of the kind of populist right, heavily promoting Trump and Vance. Um, uh, Amari and Vance are pretty close. He's been profiled in the magazine. Uh, he's been profiled in the magazine. Um, and uh, he was, uh, Vance was invited to speak at a conference, a conference, listen to this name, a conference for the common good conservatism in 2022, in 2022. Uh, Amari is, of course, thrilled to have Vance on the ticket. Quote, Donald Trump could have listened to the advice of many other characters and picked a conventional Republican. Instead, he picked someone who is reviled by the keepers of the orthodoxy on free trade and foreign policy, and who is also in line with the kind of RNC platform that we saw released last week. Uh, so, uh, yep. Now the influence is the Claremont Institute. Claremont Institute used to be very much a individual rights, constitution, declaration of independence um, uh, publication. That really changed in 2016 uh, with their embrace of Trump and their embrace of the ideas of Trump. It's a Claremont Institute that fielded John Eastman who uh, provided Trump with the kind of legal intellectual backing uh, to try to uh, re try to reject the election of 2020. In 2016, as the Claremont Institute that published the infamous essay Flight 93, which I've talked about on several shows. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, this, is a, this is an institute that used to be affiliated with historian and philosophy, philosopher Harry Jaffa, who was a very, very a strong advocate of the founders and of the Declaration of Independence, Claremont has moved a, a long way away from that. This would actually be a good topic to talk to uh, uh, Brad Thompson about because Brad is, is, is involved in that movement away. Uh, Vance is, uh, you know, uh, Vance is closely tied to Claremont. He speaks there often. He's friends with the, with the key people there, so that's another one. Last um, is Ron Dreher, uh, Rod, Rod, R-O-D, Dreher, D-R-E-H-E-R, -E who's an Orthodox Christian, not a Catholic in this case, uh, Orthodox Christian who, uh, uh, who used to be a columnist at the American Conservative, uh, ultimately moved, just to show you how committed he is to uh, uh, the conservative principles, uh, he is um, moved to Hungary, um, is an advisor on occasion to Orban and to Orban's government. Uh, he is kind of the intellectual supposedly behind that government. Uh, he is a real Christian conservative uh, and uh, that, that is trying to get Christian conservatives to, to kind of have an influence on the culture, qua culture. Uh, he, he, wrote a, he wrote a book, his latest book is A Manual for Christian Dissidents. That's the subtitle of it. Uh, and he is, again, a, a, a close friend of Vance uh, and, uh, and, and, and very influential in this whole kind of um, emphasis on Christianity, emphasis on moving away from free market, and certainly emphasis on moving away from individualism. Communitarianism is really the thing that these people are really pushing and interested in. All right, so these are some of the intellectual influences. Uh, these are, I, I think, quite important. Um, so J.D. Vance, I think I told you yesterday, went through this intellectual process of discovery. He started out as a, you know, in a, in, a, in a family that was kind of evangelical, you know, a Protestant, emotionalist, televangelist, uh, who didn't go to church, but really believed in Jesus and everything was about Christ, didn't like Catholics, didn't like organized religion, 
but we're very Christian. Two, some version of atheism, to rediscovery of Christianity, to conversion to Catholicism. Um, and, you know, some of this is, uh, it comes from his internal kind of struggles with what kind of person he wanted to be and what kind of life he wanted to live. Um, so here's a, here's a quote from his essay um, where he's talking about the things, kind of the, 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 the conflicts and the, uh, the intellectual battle going on is in, within his mind that ultimately led him to Catholicism and led him to this political view, this anti-individualist, anti-free market uh, view of politics and, and how he came to be where he is intellectually, if you will. Um, so this is uh, when he was at, this is when he's describing, he wrote this recently, but this is when he's describing his time at Yale University. He just met his, the woman who was going to be his wife um, at Yale University. And so this is what he writes, quote, this is J.D. Vance writing. Uh, Though I had fallen in love, I found that emotional demons of my childhood made it hard to be the type of partner I'd always wanted to be. And here's the kicker. My Randian arrogance about my own ability melted away. So <laughs> my Randian arrogance. So what has Rand represented his mind? We'll see as we go through this. What Rand represents in his mind, I think psychologically, is confidence, self-esteem, I think a, a drive towards uh, professional success, achievement, merit. So he writes, my Randian arrogance about my own ability melted away when confronted with the realization that an obsession, obsession with achievement would fail to produce the achievement that mattered most to me for so much of my life a happy, thriving family. You can see that how the notion of career versus family, I think, and, and career versus happiness, career versus spirituality, career versus, you know, uh, uh, meaning in life, versus meaning in life. It's so interesting how that, I think, plays such a key role in people's abandonment of, call it a Randian view of the world, an abandonment of, uh, a, you know, a, a free market individualistic approach and embrace often of Catholicism or Christianity as an alternative. So I'll read you this section again and then we'll go on. My Randian arrogance about my own ability melted away when confronted with the realization that an obsession with achievement would fail to produce the achievement that mattered most to me for so much of my life, a happy, thriving family. Tomorrow, uh, I'll do a show on happiness, and we'll talk about whether the two are in conflict. I continue with J.D. Vance. I had immersed myself in the logic of the meritocracy and found it deeply unsatisfying. And I began to wonder where all these worldly markers of success actually making me a better person. Notice the order here. Markers of success versus better person. Morality, remember, is altruism. Altruism will not lead you to worldly success. I had, traded, uh, I had traded virtue for achievement. I had traded virtue for achievement. That's very Christian, right? Is an achievement virtue? Isn't there virtue in achievement? So again, were all these worldly markers of success actually making me a better person? If I had traded virtue for achievement and found that... No, I had traded virtue for achievement and found the latter wanting. Yeah, 
achievement without virtue is indeed wanting. Maybe you should question the, the virtue, not the achievement. But the woman I wanted to marry cared little whether I obtained a Supreme Court clerkship. She wanted me to be a good person. Yes, you should be. But know what a good person means. To be a good person means to be a good Christian. Means because the only definition of goodness is, the only definition of virtue is the one provided by Christianity. Continue as I considered these twin desires for success and character and how they conflicted and didn't, I came across a meditation from St. Augustine, Augustine on Genesis. I had been a fan of Augustine since a political theorist in college assigned City of God. Now, this is Augustine. I can't think of a worst influence to have in one's life than Augustine. The worst elements of Christianity and Plato are in Augustine. The complete subjugation of the individual, the individual's mind, reason, to the church is in Augustine. The subjugation of human desires to God, to Christ, to the church, that's from Augustine. So here we have the vice president of the United States who became a Catholic and is inspired by Augustine, or Augustine, however you want to pronounce it, and is troubled by the challenge the challenge of success and character. To what extent do they conflict? To what extent don't? Also reading this essay, which he wrote, one of the fascinating things that comes across is a lot of his desire for success is because he's second-handed and he acknowledges it, that he wants to fit in that he wants to be part of the elite because he comes from such a horrible background. And it's only his realization that he's being second-handed that moves him in this direction of ultimately going into politics, but moves him in this direction of Christianity, Catholicism, and going into politics. It's because his desire for elitism, for the wealth, for the success, even though he, he does pretty well as a venture capitalist, and he makes some money. So uh, J.D. Vance doesn't strike me, or maybe, I don't know what psychologically. I, I, is he driven by power lust? Is that what really is driving it, and this is a rationalization? Or is he really an intellectual who wants to, who wants to use it for the common good as he perceives it? So he quotes extensively from Augustine. I'm going to spare you that. Um, he also quotes from Girard, but I, you know, I don't know. I don't know how much we want to get into Girard. Girard is, 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 is uh, challenging, and I'm not sure. Uh, uh, Silvanos asks, can you remind us the difference between an objectivist and a Randian? There, there is no such thing as a Randian. I mean... Iranian is somebody who thinks they've been influenced by Rand, I think. People refer to themselves and other people as Randians. Oh, he's, he's one of those who takes Rand seriously. Objectivism is somebody who adheres, objectivist, sorry. Objectivist is somebody who embraces the objectivist philosophy, that makes the objectivist philosophy his own. He tries to and is committed to it fully, partially, but is committed to it. So Randian is much more informal, right? It's, he's been influenced by Rand. He's acting like 
a character from Ayn Rand, something like that. And often used in a derogatory way. Like, I think J.D. Vance is doing it here with regard to himself. But it is interesting because it means he's read Rand. He knows what Randian arrogance means. It's how it work. That's what Randian arrogance means. When you think Randian arrogance, how it work. That's what he's trying to escape. That's what he didn't, but he didn't get the spiritual dimension of that. He didn't get, he got that that is in conflict with family. That is in conflict with happiness. So, J.D. Vance is, is still looking, right? He's looking for, for his intellectual center point, what he's going to do and where he's going to go. And uh, so this is what he writes. This is later on in the essay. And as I reflected on these competing views of the world and the wisdom and shortcomings of each, I felt desperate for a worldview that understood a bad behavior, a simultaneously social and individual structural and moral. This is coming out of uh, 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 Hillbilly uh, elegy because, uh, you know, it's trying to understand why are they behaving so badly? Why did his mother behave so bad? Why was his mother so, uh, uh, you know, dependent on alcohol and, 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 and so, uh, so bad? Why did his father leave? Why, why did the culture around him be so bad? And you can, you know, conservatives say personal responsibility. And he's saying, is it just that? Is it just that? And he's saying it's social and individual, structural and moral. So he's looking at, for something that explains all that, that recognizes, I continue to quote, that recognizes that we are products of our environment. We are products of our environment, guys. And that we have a responsibility to change that environment. But that we are still moral beings with individual duties. Duties. One that could speak against rising rates of divorce and addiction not as sanitized conclusions about their negative social externalities, but with moral outrage. So that's where he gets to, right? So yeah, I'm gonna read this to you again because I think it's important. And as I reflected on these competing views of the world and the wisdom and shortcoming of each, I felt desperate for a worldview that understood our moral behavior and simultaneously social an individual, structural, and moral that recognize that we are products of our environment, that we have responsibility to change that environment, but that we are still moral beings with individual duties that one could speak against rising rates of divorce and addiction, not as sanitized conclusions about their negatives, social externalities, but with moral outrage. So he's looking for a morality, a morality, a moral code. But a moral code that has wisdom, it, that it can explain the wisdom and shortcomings of each. Doesn't it sound like Augustine? Shortcomings of each. Augustine is the guy who made original sin the essence or a big part of Christianity, both Catholic and Protestant. So he, Augustine is a lot about individual shortcomings. And then he writes, and I realized, eventually, that I had already been exposed to that worldview. It was my mawa's, that's his grandmother's, Christianity. And the name it gave for the behaviors I have seen destroy lives and communities was sin. I remember one of my least favorite passages from the scriptures, Numbers 14, 18, in a new light, quote, the Lord, the Lord is slow to anger, uh, uh, abounding in love and forgiving sin and rebellion. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. By the way, I consider that passage one of the evilest in all of the Bible, right? He punishes the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Can you think of anything more evil? 
Vance writes, a decade ago, I took this as evidence of a vengeful, irrational God. Yet who could look at the statistics of what our early 21st century culture and politics had wrought? The misery, the rising suicide rates, the deaths of despair in the richest country on earth, and doubt that sins of the parents may ha had any effect on their children. It's not the same. And here again, the words of St. Augustine echoed from a millennium and a half earlier, articulating a truth I'd felt for a long time but hadn't spoken. So again, he quotes extensively from Augustine. He, uh, he summarizes, um, this is a description from Augustine. This is after he quotes another uh, 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 quote from Augustine, where Augustine is describing the, the life of, of Rome. This is towards the end of the Roman Empire, towards its decline and failure. He, uh, uh, Vance writes about this. It was the best criticism of our modern age I'd ever read. A society oriented entirely towards consumption and pleasure, spurning duty and virtue, duty and virtue, duty. Not long after I first read these words, my friend Arne Cass published a book arguing that American policymakers have focused far too much on promoting consumption as opposed to productivity or some other measure of well-being. The reaction, criticizing Owen for daring to push policies that might lower consumption, almost proved the argument. Yes, I found myself saying, Owen's prefer preferred policies might reduce per capita consumption, but that's precisely the point. Our society is more than the sum of its economic statistics. If people die sooner in the midst of historical levels of consumption, then perhaps our focus on consumption is misguided. By the way, that is all true. Right, the issue of consumption. But not in the same way I understand it. That is all true from the from an economic perspective. Consumption is not what drives an economy. I say this often. It's production. Consumption is also not what brings you happiness. It's production. But here, it's not about that idea. It's not about the virtue of work. It's not about all of that. This is more about how dare they seek pleasure? How dare they be self-interested? How dare they pursue their own interests? That's what consumption represents to these religious nuts. It's not about let's free up production because they're not about freeing up production. They're about, and, and from their perspective, this is Owen Cass and J.D. Vance's, Production is Marxist production. Production is muscle. Production is the worker. For them, freeing up production is emphasizing the value, emphasizing the value of the worker and rejecting, you know, the, the, the CEO, the management, rejecting capitalism, rejecting capital, rejecting Wall Street, and celebrating the worker. Marx would be proud of both Cass and J.D. Vance. Anyway. <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine. Um, I mean, uh, anybody worse for the future of America uh, than Vance. I really can't think of anybody in our political world today, except for Josh Hawley, who is very, very similar to Vance. Also, Josh Hawley, huge admirer of Augustine. And a, uh, a, a, a J.D., uh, what's his name? Uh, Hawley has, uh, wrote an essay a long time ago about his, his uh, about how Pelagius Pelagius was a, um, a Christian who believed didn't believe in original sin. 
He believed in free will. And he believed that happiness was attainable in this earth. He also believed a lot of bad things, but he believed those things. And Hawley and Augustine, <laughs> Hawley uses Augustine to rip Pelagian to shreds and condemn kind of the modern church that says, oh, no, no, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be prosperous. God wants you to be successful. Go out and enjoy material wealth. He rips that to shreds. Hawley is vehemently anti-Pelagius, who was relatively rational for the Catholic Church of the time. And so was Augustine. Augustine hated Pelagius. They were the opposite. Uh, so, I mean, I can't think of anybody in the political world today worse than who, who, who could potentially do more damage to America in the future than Josh Hawley and J.D. Vance. And J.D. Vance just got a ticket to the White House. Leonard Peikoff, in The Dim Hypothesis, says... It, this is my interpretation. I'm not putting words in Lena's mouth. I was, I should have, I should have picked out the passage I wanted to read to you. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. Out of, out of the, uh, well, tomorrow's a positive show, so uh, maybe next week. Out, out of, out of dim hypothesis. But, but he, he says in a dim hypothesis, this is me paraphrasing my interpretation, not speaking for Lena Peikoff. He says in that he says the right. God, the right is probably where the dictatorship is going to come from. It's probably going to be religion wrapped in a flag. Patriotic and religion is what will lead us to authoritarianism, to this, what he conceives, M2, a misintegration that is the future of America under authoritarianism. And he, uh, he says, there's a passage there that he says something like, what the religionists are now missing are the intellectuals to lay the groundwork for that ultimate achievement, that ultimate success, that ultimate domination. They're missing the intellectuals. Well, here they are. In Patrick Deneen, in Vermeule, in the National Conservative Movement, in, uh, what's his name? Uh, Mudbug or whatever his name is. In uh, uh, the, the Claremont Review of books, the Claremont Institute. In Sohaba Maui. There they are. They're right there. They're right in front of our noses right now. Exactly as Leonard Peikoff predicted. Exactly. And now they have their first real committed, committed political candidate. Political candidate on the verge of great power. Again, I think Josh Hawley was there first. And not only that, they have a Republican Party that is mindless, that will be swayed easily, swayed by Donald Trump. You have a political party that is eager to find that system that can guide them into the future. And, you know, his, his prediction, what was it now? That was written 10 years ago. So he was predicting authoritarianism in another 40 years. It's much closer now. It's sooner than you think. Because here they are. Here they are. It's no longer they will have to develop the intellectuals to sway the culture, to dominate. They have them. They, they are. 
and they're, and they're taking slowly the reins of power. It's scary, guys. I always thought that Trump was scary, but I thought Trump was setting in motion something that would take a while to play out. I thought Trump was setting in motion his mindlessness, his pragmatism would somehow uh, uh, delay uh, the, the rise of, of these intellectuals. With this pick, he's given them a fast track. And it should have been obvious. It should have been obvious that this is the direction, we, the, the, this is the direction we're heading.